All right, I think we'll get started. So we are three minutes past the hour. Um, for those of you joining the call, um, you're going to see six people on the screen. But if you double click on the slide deck, if this happens to be your, your first presentation at Nest, you'll get a full screen view of it just to, to tell people that. So thank you very much for taking the time to join our little session. Um, have a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, wherever you are. Um, and let's get started. So this is the CPE year in review. So we wanted to put a session together to one, let you know what your CPE team um, has been doing for the last year. And we're pretty much going from flock to nest to try and keep it a, a continuous story. And hopefully we'll get to do this next year in person. Um, your presenters today are myself, Lee Griffin, and I'm the engineering manager for CPE. Um, Pierre-Yves Chabon, who's our technical lead, and Aoife Maloney, our product owner. And I'll leave Aoife and Pierre introduce themselves when they get to their relevant sections within it. Um, I want to kind of begin by talking about the scope of the team. Um, but before we do that, let's have a quick reminder of the mission that we have. So the CPE team um, services both the Fedora and the CentOS communities. So we're actually split between um, two communities that have a very close relationship and a lot of overlap. So our main goal uh, is to provide systems administration uh, in and around the infrastructure and release engineering that helps go towards um, producing these um, outputs, which end up being operating systems, as well as the services that run in that production line and a lot of other services in between, as we're going to see going through the, the presentation. Um, we also deal with application uh, maintenance. So there's a, a specific set of apps that we have been designated as the owner of. And we try to provide maintenance there, including upgrades and um, bug fixes and so on. And then the last part is we're a gun for hire or a team for hire, if you want to call it that, where we actually build out initiatives. So this is where um, the Fedora and the CentOS communities can come to us with a request uh, to utilize the fact that we have full time and very talented software engineers uh, and infrastructure folks available to try and produce something new and cool that will ultimately help the ecosystems that we work in. So that's pretty much the, the three kind of pillars that the team is built upon. And you might have noticed on the first slide, and you'll certainly notice on the, the bottom right of every one of them, there's a logo. So we have a logo since we um, turned up last year. Um, we were actually a little bit surprised when the Facebook um, client platform engineering team turned up with their CPE logo. So we were somewhat inspired by that and we wanted to get a strong identity. Uh, and there's a lot of symbolism in this and, and I won't spoil it too much and I'll try and let people guess where some of the symbolism is coming from. And you can hit that up in the chat and we'll reply to it as the call goes on. Um, but I do want to take the time to, to call out Mo Duffy um, and her creative ability to pull this together. It's been a fantastic effort. The team absolutely love it. And this is really the first time we're getting to unveil this um, more publicly. So you're going to see it on a lot of our um, outputs in the, the coming months and years. So um, in Irish, because I know Mo has a, um, a love of the Irish language, Gaurav Mila Motagot, Maureen. So the scope of responsibility is just something I want to touch on here. Um, as I said in, in the, the earlier slide, we do look after services. And last flock, um, believe it or not, for the team of our size, we maintained or were on the hook for 130 plus services. Um, that means we're responsible for the life cycle of them from bug fixes to upgrades to enhancements. And we had to do a lot of soul searching to go through those applications and retire some apps that really should have been retired a long time ago. These are applications that were still on Fedora 2. Um, in some cases, they'd fallen over and not been restarted and nobody really missed them. And in other cases, we looked at unifying the services that we have on both the CentOS side and on the Fedora side. Uh, one example of that was the, the PACE service, which now redirects to the CentOS PACE. So in the last year, um, we've managed to reduce our focus, shall we say, our footprint to look after 56 applications that we have designated as run and maintain. By that, we mean we look after the service lifecycle uh, as well as bug fixes, upgrades, enhancements, and any kind of requests that come in, particularly community contributions, which we always love. Um, we have 35 other applications that are within our infrastructure where we provide power and ping. And that's a really cool way of saying that we'll host them only for the, the community or for other teams, um, potentially within Red Hat that, that work within the community. 
Um, what does that mean? It, it means we don't understand the code base. Uh, we probably don't even have permissions to go and, and make changes in that code base. And if it falls over or hiccups somehow, we'll try and restart it. And if we can't, we'll have to tap someone on the shoulder and ask them to, to get involved. That is still a huge footprint, um, as you can see. And, and you'll see in a minute the, the number of people we have in our team. And one thing we really struggle with is how do we reduce that number? Because invariably, an application in here is useful to some people. And we're going to have to have some difficult decisions with the community over the coming year because a big blocker is our, our friendly data protection um, laws, which is GDPR. And it means we can't gift an application to someone because if we try and gift it to someone, we lose the data. Now, all of these applications are open source, so anyone in theory can take it and run it and so on. But the real value in a lot of these applications is the data that they hold. And we have no way of gifting an application without having to go in and surgically attack the data, um, which is, is just so difficult. So we'll do a call to arms later on to see how people can help with this and, and what that looks like from a conversation. And, and maybe in the Q&A, people might have questions around this for us. So that's one half of the, the coin. The other half is infrastructure. Um, because we look after two sets of, of infrastructures, um, we kind of broke it out here so people can see it. So in Fedora, we have 117 physical and 250 virtual systems. Now, since our, our Colo mover, our data center move, um, we have multiple XVMs that are hopefully getting migrated to OpenShift pods, and we haven't counted them in this number. Uh, CentOS is 147 physical servers, and CentOS CI is 278. Now, the CI is a shared service between CentOS and Fedora, which a lot of our community use day in, day out. The obvious um, scope of responsibility here is regular maintenance, making sure we're up to date with patches. Um, you've seen the, the boot hole vulnerability last week. That had our team working very busy behind the scenes to make sure all of our servers and all of our infrastructure um, was up to date. Uh, we also look after every single thing from soup to nuts, to, to borrow a, a well-used American phrase, um, including the networking, the layouts of the data center, um, cooling, backups, hardware upgrades, warranties, you name it to do with the, the life cycle of the server, it falls under our team. Uh, and the last one before I'm going to pass it over to maybe the, the more meaty section um, is the team composition. So the team has actually grown over the last year. We've had several new hires. Um, we've expanded our infrastructure team with two new hires, and we've replaced some team members in our development side as well. That kind of stayed more or less level. So we're really up maybe two net new infrastructure folks. Uh, we created a product owner role, and that's Aoife, who you're going to hear from in a couple of minutes. And we expanded the management team because um, people need people management within Red Hat as a company, and that's allowed us to expand that out um, to give those folks good career paths and good career opportunities. So the breakdown is on the slide. I'm not going to read it out, um, and we'll share the link in the chat if Pierre hasn't done it already to the PDF if you want to refer back to this. But that's the rough breakdown of people that we have within the team. So it's 27 to 28 people all in, um, and it's not evenly divided. So that means if we have a software engineering effort, we can't throw 28 people at it, for example. We only have 14. And as you'll see in a couple of minutes, um, that effort is split across multiple initiatives and multiple things that we own. OK, I want to pass it over to Pierre. Um, Pierre, I'm happy to keep sharing. Just give me a shout when we want to change um, slides. Sure. Uh, so I'm uh, Pierre Fibon, also known as Pingu, and probably better known as Pingu. Uh, as we've seen yesterday in the, the pub quiz, if you missed that. Um, so um, I've been in Fedora since 2007. I've been in Red Hat for about seven years, and I'm now the team lead of the CPE team, uh, which is basically the only team I've been at uh, since I joined Red Hat. Uh, so I'm going to run you through a little bit of uh, what we've been working on over the last year. Uh, we'll start uh, with the first one. Uh, right getting. Uh, so if you remember last year, we were in the middle of implementing this uh, and it landed basically late 2019. Uh, we already gave a couple of presentations at DevConf as well as post them about, uh, about it, about how it works and, uh, and the process there. Uh, both videos are online if you want to check them out. Uh, but basically, it was um, it was an important initiative for us because I think it was one of the first initiatives that we approached as a team. 
that ended up being multi months. I could even say multi years, but uh, because of the different iteration that it went through. But the last iteration was the one that uh, finally succeeded, uh, which ended up being approached as a team. Multiple people in the team were involved in that. It ended up also being a very much a multi-system uh, initiative because we had to implement things in Fed package, in Koji, in Body, in Fedora CI, and then coordinate with you know GreenWave and WeaverDB, who are the, the core of the getting mechanisms here. Um, so we involve people uh, outside of our team as well as multiple people within our team to be able to reach that. And the end, the end result is that we have uh, we are able to gate right packages before they land in the right build route in a way that is fully automatic and transparent to packagers, you know, if everything goes well. Uh, we've also added a, a couple of features which are nice outside of Rawhide, such as the um, the on-demand the on-demand site tags, uh, which are can be used on stable releases as well, which also makes things like uh, Fed package chain build uh, working nicely in stable releases. Uh, so that was the the first big one that we started. One very focused on Fedora, very focused on Ride, but it also gave us the one of the first base to how do we want to work as a team, how do we want to to progress things uh, on that front. And the next initiative. At least that's your clue. Thank you. Uh, and that's we started basically in January this year uh, is Nugging. So Nugging replaces our uh, FAST account system, FAST2. Uh, as a reminder, FAST started in 2008. The first commit I went back to check it yesterday was from Toshio uh, in 2008. It's Python 2 only. It runs Turbo Gear 1. Uh, for memory, I don't even think it runs 1.1 or 1.2, and it definitely doesn't uh, run Chubbug 2, who also exists. Uh, there is no way to port this to Python 3. Uh, we used to run it on RHEL 6, and then we tried to migrate it to RHEL 7, and we did not manage. Uh, so we are now running it in OpenShift on a RHEL 6 container. And the nice thing is that RHEL 6 is, uh, well, Python 2 is already out of, la out of uh, uh, support since the beginning of the year, and Rail 6 is getting out of support uh, in fall uh, 2020. So it's Nugging is a, was basically a, a very important project to, for us to, to work on. Um, so we are moving to a more modern platform. It's basically a free IP on the back end, uh, and Nugging is the is built on the top of it, and it's basically a, a self service or community portal to free IPA. Uh, adding a lot of the feature that FreeIPA does not provide, uh, such as you know the possibility of changing your password yourself. Uh, but we also rely on a lot of the feature that FreeIPA provides, such as two-factor authentication. Uh, we currently have two-factor authentication, but it's only ever used or useful for people who are in the sysadmins are, and actually have shared access to the machines. Uh, if you you know, want to log in in any of our web app, you don't have to, uh, we don't have two-factor authentication support. Well, that is something that's going to change uh, on the nugging front, at least nugging itself will support uh, 2FA and then we'll need to see how we can explain this to our different applications. And then we know we have things which are, you know, Python 3, of course, uh, but we have things which are kind of nice and they have become standard since, uh, since, fast, was, since fast was created. Things like unit test, FADS did not have any. Uh, it's built from the start to be able to be deployed and run in OpenShift. Uh, it uses Flask as a framework as a side effect. Uh, this has also been a, a multi-months and multi-team effort. Uh, definitely multi-months. It started in January and we are looking to deploy this in, uh, in fall. Uh, currently being working on deploying this in staging and then production in fall. Uh, multi-team because CP has been uh, collaborating a lot with the IPA folks and we are very uh, uh, appreciative of everything they have been able to help us with. Uh, there's a number of things they have done to, to free IP itself or to an extension to it for, for our needs. So that was uh, very nice of them to to help us and basically to be able to pro to work on that. Um, the, the nice thing about that project is also a multi-communities project because that it affects Fedora, but it also affects CentOS. And then, as a matter of fact, CentOS is going to be using the same nugging instance as Fedora which means you as federal community member are going to have a CentOS account in the same way that CentOS community member will be getting a federal account. So, you know, if you want to contribute to anything on CentOS, you'll be using the same uh, 
the same account system, if CentOS folks want to contribute anything to Fedora, they'll be using that exact same account system. But it's not the only communities that are involved. The OpenSUSE community is actually looking at deploying Noggin. And by the look of it, they may actually be the first one deploying Noggin, not us. Uh, so that's very nice to see that uh, something we are building uh, is going to be uh, reused uh, you know, outside of the family, although it remains the RPM family, but it is outside of the direct family. Uh, many thanks to Neil Gompa and the OpenSUSE heroes, I think that's how they call those Chesamians, uh, you know, for everything that they are doing and they are looking at, they have already done the packaging work, so that's also something which is nice, uh, and they have been reporting bugs and, uh, and issues, so that's a, it's a nice collaborative they fought there. So you can see we we moved from, from ride getting, which was very um, Fedora centric, to Noggin, which is already involving a, a bit more communities, uh, but we also we also Red Hat basically. Red Hat still is our paycheck. So one of the sub projects that I'd like to put forward, and Lee, that's your cue now. Oh, it's not following. You can hear the keyboard. He's typing his email. Ah, <laughs> oh, there we go. Uh, so one of the bigger one is uh, is Santa Stream. Uh, so the way I would dephrase Santa Stream is basically Red Hat's effort to open its build pipeline. Uh, to open up the way it builds uh, rail and uh, so it's basically the a public view a public view to uh, the the next rail dot y release so fedora remains the dot x release the, the next the next version of rail is based on fedora the next minor version of rail will be based on santa stream uh, that is definitely a multi month force it's starting in fall 2019 uh, it's going to end up uh, probably running into 2021 somewhere uh, definitely multi-teams because, uh, well, it involves CP for for a number of things since we also look after centers, but it, it involves a large number of people also internally. There are, no, you know, I I can't comment on the number of teams uh, involved in there, but I actually, uh, uh, you know, the people involved in there have a full agenda <laughs> and their ends are full with meetings and trying to gather the inputs for everyone and moving that forward. So it's a, it's a really big project that is impacting communities as well as the, the business side of uh, of our team but that's not the we haven't we haven't worked on only these three projects we actually worked on some more so we have worked on dnf counting which uh, much uh, matthew miller uh, gave a you know spoke about in the in the in the state of fedora uh, better statistics based on the count me value that DNF sends about once a week uh, when you retrieve the repository metadata. Um, it's something you can configure, you can opt in, opt out. It's, you, you can opt out, basically, you're opt in by default. Uh, you have no personal information sent other, in other than the edge of your system, and that's basically sent only about once a week. Uh, if you haven't touched the way your default configuration or default DNFs works. Uh, we've, we're still working on the Fedora messaging, so we do have a message bus called FedMessage as was used on the Zero MQ technology. We're moving to a Fedora messaging one uh, that's based on RabbitMQ uh, MQP technology with a RabbitMQ server. Uh, there is still some work to be done. A number of applications have been ported. So actually most of our applications today are running Fedora messaging, but we did the minimal, the minimal amount of work to do that, which is uh, porting directly. Uh, now we need to add message schemas, and this is a requirement to be able to replace something like FMN or to upgrade our uh, data gripper applications. Both of them are actually uh, need to be able to translate the JSON blob that is being sent on, on the on the message bus to something which humans can understand, um, and that's where the, the message schemas come into play. Uh, we've also uh, introduced uh, something called toddlers that you may have heard about yesterday if you were at the pub quiz. Uh, it's just a bunch of small programs running around. So it's basically it's meant to be a plugin-based uh, federal messaging consumer, uh, where we we are able to consolidate more of the code base. To to re we've been able to retire so far at least two projects, and there is a third one that will be retired just because of uh, we are leveraging the toddler framework and and uh, and running this uh, easily. Uh, something it does currently, basically, if you're uh, in the Fedora bugs group in FAS, uh, you have certain privileges in Bugzilla. Uh, that is toddler that thinks everybody in the Fedora bugs group in FAS should have these privileges in Bugzilla. Uh, when you do a, success a successful build in Koji, we flag the corresponding commit on this git. This is a toddler doing that. 
uh, if you run, if you open a pull request on this git, CI runs, CI sends a message, toddler gets this message and flag the pull request with the result of that uh, CI run. Uh, the next one that we are going to be working on is going to be syncing the assignee and CC list from this git to Bugzilla. It's already, we have already rewritten that piece of software, but it's uh, in a dedicated project, in a dedicated code base with a dedicated open shift. We just want to move that into a toddler so that we have uh, one place where we can scale uh, all of these. And that's, def that's basically a step toward retiring a uh, fed message. The, the, so far, the two projects that we have retired with toddlers were fed message based. And that's some of the project we worked on. Then we also worked on EPL8, uh, setting up the initial build environment, setting up the build route and the initial work to get uh, module support. Uh, we, we worked MB MBBox, which is module build in a box. That's a way of deploying Koji MBS in an open, an open shift environment uh, easily. And that was something that the CentOS folks are using for CentOS 8. And that's something that they are interested in to, for CentOS stream, uh, but it needed to be updated. It needed to be, up, um, you know, moved to a more easy, to an easier way to deploy as well as an easier way to maintain it, a newer version of uh, Koji and MBS, for example. Uh, so that's also something that we worked on. Um, you may remember we spoke about RPM auto spec. We're speaking about, there is a talk about it tomorrow again. Um, which the goal of there was to get rid of changelog and release field in spec files, not in RPM, only in spec files, and auto generate them uh, in the Koji uh, when you build the, the, the source RPM. Um, we're going back to we're going back to discuss that tomorrow. It's still a proof of concept. It's still available. Well, it will be available in staging once we're staging is back. Uh, but so, but yeah, we're we're eager to hear your input on that and if we should pro continue of, to work on this or not. We worked on something called monitor getting, and was basically uh, it's an end-to-end -end testing of the entire packager workflow, with the idea of being able to say uh, how well is the packager workflow working? Is it working at one point? And being able to to easily find out where it's broken. Uh, you have to realize that the um, well, you have to the, the packager workflow actually involves more than ten systems, more than ten applications from fed package to this git. Koji body. I have not listed them all here, but they are. We have counted them. There are more than ten which are involved. Uh, we're only testing the API pass. Uh, we're not testing the you know every single combination, but it, it does give us an idea on how well these ten applications are working together, uh, as well as the instead of having a single point. Well, not just can tell us an application is running for ninety five percent of the time. Uh, well, monitor getting is aimed at giving us an idea of how is the entire workflow uh, behaving. So on the top of that, we've also done something very, very small, and I'll let Ifa go on this next slide. Yeah, so as you can see, we have gotten through a fair bit in the last year. Um, I've only been privy to the last nine months of it, but even still, there has been a lot. Probably the biggest of which is our data center move. In case you didn't realize, uh, Fedora moved data centers this year. I know it was really like under the radar, nobody really noticed, but we have a couple of fun figures for you on the small project. And I'm using small with a heavy dose of sarcasm. The team were moved 107 servers, 76 servers were retired. There was 31 affected services and I didn't include staging in that one because I just hadn't it in me to count how many things are affected by that. 23 weeks of overall moving, 20 transit days between all of the hardware, 12 months of planning and executing, eight immediate team members from Red Hat IT and CPE. And I'd like to thank you, you can sing this. Um, I would like to just pause on this because we actually had a great help from Red Hat IT. There was a number of people closely involved with us throughout the whole process. They gave us priority, they were on hand. We had several meetings, several touch points. And they are, and I'm gonna get their names all wrong, but Tom Wilson, Chris Adair, uh, Seth Shivarak, couple more, um, Matthew Gagochi, and apologies to anybody I missed, but thank you hugely for that. We also had three data centers in the finish. We moved from Phoenix and we put stuff in i 2 and RDU, so it wasn't enough to just move from one to the other and an extra one. We had three managers managing, two sysadmins holding down the entire operation, one product owner praying, and all we were short was the partridge in a pear tree. 
So that was um, that. Was that. <laughs> Thank you for everybody as well for your patience and your considerations and your understanding through that mammoth task. And, you know, on the top of that, we've done a number of projects. And on the top of that, there is, you know, business as usual, you know, requests from the community, hardware failures, uh, drive network issues. Uh, so what you see on the slides here is the one year, basically, uh, the screenshot is from yesterday, the Fedora issues, the ticket tracker on Pagoda.io, and the, the graph at the top there as in blue bars, the, the number of tickets that were opened that week, and in pink, the number of tickets that were closed that week. And you can see some weeks we had uh, more tickets closed than open, and some weeks we had uh, more tickets open than closed. Uh, but the, the the bottom graph is uh, is quite nice to see. It's the number of tickets that are up that have been opened in that were open in the the issue tracker over the during that week. So you can see we started the year with about 140 tickets opened in the backlog, and about spring this year we actually managed to go down to 90. I think I've seen even lower than 90. Uh, it climbed up a little bit more uh, during the color move. Uh, go figure, people are busy uh, and things break. So we actually report them and we use to get to track uh, if they are sold or not. And since the color move, we actually are back on track to, to go under the, un the 100 number of tickets and try to go, to, to go down from there. So congratulations to Smooch and, uh, and Kevin Fenzi there, who are definitely the, the two running points on, the, on running that side of the, of the team. Uh, they are doing a great job at this, and uh, you know, if you send them, you know, Nirik plus plus and Smooch plus plus, they love the cookies. That's it for me. So I guess I'm up. How to work with us? So Lee had spoke uh, in his slides about how the, we're changing the way we work, how we're trying to be a bit more visible with. Um, with a bit more structure. So I've put together a couple of slides, I'm not gonna to spend too long on them because uh, I want to save time for our question and answer session, but primarily the why, who, and how. So why did we make these changes? Uh, when I came into the team, Lee had done some forerunning with the, the team previously with the other managers of that people were reaching a point where they just needed to have a very, a more structured day-to-day. -day. And that's hard given that you know everybody is in a community setting and you know other people have day jobs and this is our day job but you know it's it's not a 24-hour day job so it was important for the team to feel that we have structure and we can pre-plan the work so that they know what's coming it was also important to set expectations for our team stakeholders so believe it or not we have people that we have to answer to and you good folk here are, are one of our stakeholders so it's important for us to have your expectations so you know what what we're doing why we're doing it and what to expect from us um, following on from that is to establish clear goals that our project teams can deliver on. So the work that we're giving ourselves to do in X amount of time, the teams all feel comfortable that they can achieve on that and they can do that. And if they can't, they have the, they're empowered and they have the confidence to say, oh, hang on a minute, what are you doing? <laughs> but thankfully, they are a team of rock stars and they are able to do anything that is thrown their way. So the who that talk and discuss and scope and weigh up the options for the projects that we work on. And I'm just speaking on the projects, the big scale projects, not the not the bug fixes, not anything that the sustaining team work do. This is projects that require multiple people a couple of couple of weeks, maybe even months, and they need to be pre-planned. Who decides what happens when? We've come up with a review team of sorts, and they're broken into the CPE review team. So that would be the management, uh, Lee Griffin and Carol and Stephen Mattiat, and also Paul Friels as our senior manager. Uh, our team leads, uh, so Piri Siobhan for the Fedora side, and Brian Stinson heads up the Centre West side. And then myself, I get to say too. But we form one voice. Then it's important that we understand that what the community needs are. So we have a Fedora rep, um, Matthew Miller is primary on that one, and Marie Norden and Ben Cotton also have helped them too. But I know that they also then speak for the wider Fedora Council and the community. We also have rep two, which is Rich Bone as their community architect, and Brian Exelbeard, I believe, is also going to be wearing that hat too. We also do have to adhere to the business because we are getting paid for this at the end of the day so it's important to know that we're on the right track there too and it's a balancing actually there's a fine line to be in 
And that business rep is Brian Exelbeard. So while we're walking a fine line, I, I do have to take my hat off to Bex wearing two hats of CentOS and the business side too. So they make up our decision maker seats at the table for our quarterly planning exercises. The how you can submit your ideas, and I'll speak a little bit more to that in the following slides, but just so you know how you can let me know that you would like something, like to, the team to work on something, is you can always email me, amaloni at redhat.com. Uh, we do have a project template, but it is in a Google Doc, so feel free to just write your ideas into a regular email, send it off to me, and we can discuss it a bit more. You can open a ticket. If you're not sure if what you want the team to work on is a bug fix or a small enhancement, or could it be a little bigger, just open a ticket as normal. The sustaining team are getting very, very good for uh, triaging. They're going to be looking out for running this enough that they know that if things are a little bit bigger, could need a bit more attention, they'll ping it on to me and triage it. So if you don't know, let us figure it out. You can always message us on hashtag Red Hat CPE, or you can DM me directly at Amaloni on Freenode, or you can always join my weekly office hours. They are on a Thursday at 1300 UTC at Fedora meeting one. A couple of people have been joining, which is great, but I'm always hanging around there for an hour if there's anything you want to ask or talk about. Next slide, please, Sharon. <laughs> so, Smear. Goal, Gomal, I apologize, I'm getting the surname wrong. An um, intern that was working with Marie in the Fedora project has put together a fantastic um, infographic for us on our processes. Thank you. Yeah, massive uh, karma to Samira. It's, it's beautiful. My next slide is going to look like a bag of shit compared to it. Sorry, I couldn't help it. <laughs> so this is our formal initiative process. Um, it is going to be publish, published on uh, docs.fpo4, if that's CPE. <laughs> you did, Carl. But, <laughs> but I just wanted to highlight that we have been working with Fedora. We have had fantastic help and like, look at that, that's so cool. But it does encompass the business side and the, um, the community side. And I'm aware this is a community. <laughs> Stop <laughs> distracting me. I'm aware this is a community uh, conference. So I'm going to speak a bit more on the community side of it. Next slide, Chan. So community edit of that. As you can see, that's my bag of shit compared to the other one. It is nowhere near as nice, but I hope it kind of does it justice. And I know Marie and Mo and Smear are probably like this at home, and I'm sorry. But anyway, so as I said in the previous slide, if you are a <laughs> if you are a community member and you have an issue you'd like the CPE team to work on, just file it in the normal channels. So um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so file it normally. It flows into our sustaining team. They review it during their twice daily standups. If they think it's something that they can action, they will just move it straight down into their their tracker. Or if they think it's something a little bit bigger they will triage it to me. So I'll usually get tagged or I'll get an email or I'll get a Google chat going, hey Maloney, check this out. And then I go, holy shit, Lee, what does this mean? But no, <laughs> um, I will review it and then it goes into the scoping phase. So more than likely you will get an email or something from me if you are the requester, just asking for some more information if we feel we need it. We'll start walking through the process. I will then move it into a Google Doc to, to capture it more formally. And we will walk through the requirements, walk through the, the, the estimated timeline, what kind of skill sets may be needed to complete this task. And then we will move it to the review with review with the CPE management team, the CPE review team initially. If the CPE management team feel that it is something that we should be considering, if the wider review team are saying, yes, this is absolutely something that we should be addressing for communities. We'll move it then on to a more formal project brief and we add it to our backlog for QP voting. If when we're reviewing it by the review team and it's deemed as something that is either just not meeting our mission statement, it's not really anything that we could complete or it's just not happening, we'll let you know. The ticket will be closed, it'll be updated and the requester or the filer will know. So that is it in a nutshell. If you have something big, file a ticket, it'll flow through the rest of that. Back in Jul the start of July, you may remember that I had sent out an email to uh, announce uh, announce list. 
And this is some of the feedback that I got. So I had sent that gorgeous infographic that uh, Samira created for us, along with a lot of text around why we're doing this, what we consider big, what we consider bug fixes, and we wanted your feedback on it. It is very important for me, who is kind of the gatekeeper of projects for all the world, to understand what the community wants, what we're doing that could be better, what we're doing that you like, and what we're doing that you think is useless. Just leave it out altogether. So these were some of the points that I got. Uh, continue to communicate clearly and regularly on projects and updates. Uh, less acronyms and abbreviation and comms. Do you see what I did there? Uh, publish the team member time zones on docs.fpo, that's forward slash CPE, <laughs> uh, and help to help define our working hours. And um, that was actually a really good point, and it was quite an obvious one. And I thank you. I think Martin was the one who had messaged me that privately. So that is something that we can absolutely action. Um, also publish the workflow diagram to Docs CP, and then have something filtered that relates to who you're coming, what area you're coming from. If you're coming from a Fedora community contributor space, this is what really you need to look at. If you're coming from a Red Hat business unit space, this is this is where you should be kind of filtering the request to. Uh, people seem to enjoy the office errors. And also they're requesting a public tracker for bugs as well, which I know Pingo has been working on and maybe speaking about already. So it's good. All in all, not too bad. Next slide. This is my last slide, you'll be pleased to know. A um, couple of key dates for your diary. So following on from my email about the engagement, our, some of the members from CPE team led by one of the managers and has put together, and actually Vipul has stitched the whole thing together. Thank you, Vipul, has stitched together a survey. So our survey says, please complete it by August 30th. It's been sent to the devil and infra lists. If you haven't done, seen it, please check there and filter it and complete. It's closing by then. September 9th is the new initiative submission deadline for CP. So if you do have something that you'd like us to consider working on, uh, please email me, file a ticket, but, but do it before September 9th, which is, to, uh, no, I was going to say it's tomorrow, but I'm a month ahead of myself. <laughs> uh, so you have a little over five weeks for that. Uh, September 18th. Thanks, Luna. And September 18th is when we're, the CPE team are going to host our quarterly planning session. So by submitting ideas, suggestions by September 9th, it will allow our team to have two weeks to review them and see how much work is involved in them. And we can then confidently add them to our backlog and put them for consideration to the wider review team then for voting. September 30th is where quarter three ends. So we have a number of projects starting from Q2 and they are going to be running to completion are certainly what we want our goals to have been. We want them to be hit by then. And then October 4th is when CPU will recognize when our quarter four begins. And the projects that we will have reviewed on September 18th and voted on as, yes, the most important we must do, will start and kick off then. And I think that is me finished. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Aoife, and thanks, nice. Pierre, for the, the overview of the projects as well. And I think what's worth calling out, just to, to briefly go back to the slide for a second, is these are key dates that will help us line the teams up, get the right level of analysis done, so that we can actually ship something and deliver it. So 12 months ago at Flock, um, I gave a presentation about the process we were trying to put in, um, open source Agile, I think was the official title of it. And since then, um, and just to call her out, because she's on the, the call and on the screen, we had Sarah uh, join the team. So Sarah Finn is an Agile practitioner within the team. Um, and it's helped the team just get into that mode of delivery because it was becoming frustrating for the team and I'm sure for the community to work on something and get it so far and then get your attention pulled to something else. So we, we kind of set a mantra out uh, and Vipil probably has several memes about this now. Um, about stop starting and start finishing. So to try and get stuff shipped and over the line usable for our community. And that's why we have dates like this. This is where this kind of process came from. And we are going into our third full quarter of it, which we're in at the moment for Q3. We're on a calendar year quarter. And in Q2, um, we hit 100% delivery. So 100% of what we wanted to deliver in that three month window was completed. And that gives a lot of confidence, um, hopefully to the community uh, and certainly to our team, that if you ask for something and if we say we're going to work on it in quarter whatever, that you're going to get it at the end of that quarter. And I think that's a really important um, note to call out. 
Now, they're all the positives. And I just want to kind of end um, on just some of the future challenges. And this is not meant to be negative or anything like this at all. But this is where the team are constantly moving towards. We're constantly resetting the horizon goal, moving forward to try and tackle new challenges and add more value um, to our communities. And something that we want to start tackling, and, and we've already begun this process, um, you've heard the word sustaining team mentioned by both Eve and Pierre. We probably should have given a couple more slides on that or maybe a dedicated talk. But the sustaining team is really capturing the lights on or the business as usual work that we're actually doing in both Fedora and CentOS. It's actually heavily tilted towards Fedora at the moment um, because that was where our biggest scope of responsibility with 130 plus applications were. And that was trying to get a handle on just what do we do every day? Um, where is the source of our pain? Where's our contention coming from? It's to avoid gut feelings to say that we're, we're working in this area because we think there's problems and it's helping us gather stats and gather some information um, about what's going on and to help inform where we need to put some effort. So the packager workflow analysis that Pierre mentioned um, is something that has come from the, the sustaining initiative, from listening to the community, from observing various bug reports, and now we're investing time to see, is this actually a problem? And what is the actual output that has to come from it? But right now, um, out of our 20, 24 actual active developer sysadmin documentation folks is really what's available to us. Um, it's over 50% of that team is literally keeping the lights on primarily for Fedora. Um, that is a huge number. And it's questionable what value that's actually bringing when you look at the rising number of tickets. And, and it's great to see the trend going downwards in bugs. But every 10 bugs we fix, we're getting 8 to 10 bugs opening up again. And that's pointing towards instability. That's pointing towards technical debt. That's pointing towards... Um, just the age of a lot of our services that we inherited and not only the code base. So by having greater than 50% of our team working on these things, it's given us little time to innovate and build new things, which I know is what the community want. And as software engineers, that's exactly what we want to do as well. We want to build stuff and ship it out as well. So technical debt is going to become a focus for us in the coming year, retiring fed message, retiring older applications, modernizing the stack, um, the recent Colo move um, for the, all the fun of the 12 Days of Christmas song that we had for it, it nearly killed our ability to service the project. Um, we hit so many problems going through it. You would have seen the various mail shots, the daily and weekly updates that were going out towards the end. And that put incredible stress and strain uh, on both Smooge and Kevin to try and get that over the line. So we're trying to get more people skilled up to be able to service and work on these areas and obviously address some of the root causes that cause this instability when we try to bring all of our service stack back online. Um, that means we're going to have to engage and have hard, conversa hard conversations and make hard decisions to possibly retire applications, amalgamate applications, um, or see can we bridge that GDPR gap somehow and get more community involvement. Um, one goal and target that we've been saying for a long time, but it's certainly on our agenda with this technical debt reduction is to make this more community available to service and to try and lessen the need for CPE to be a roadblock on some of these requests. Um, so getting more help on the workload, uh, always appreciated. You see the initiatives, you see that we have them tracked, they're publicly available. And it's been fantastic, particularly on the Noggin project where we had a couple of community contributions very early in the cycle. And then as the, the work matured, we got a hell of a lot more work, which was called out already when Open Susie and Neil and the guys working around that area. That's fantastic. And we love that. And please keep staying involved. But if we can get more help on the lights on workload, that will give us more opportunities to work on fun stuff and, and really move those initiatives um, to another level. Uh, better communications. Uh, I think that's something that we always strive towards. And over the last year, we've introduced um, the weekly mail shot from IFA. Um, we now participate on the Fedora Council. I think IFA has presented twice at this stage um, just about what CP are doing. Um, we try to hold office hours. We try to get as involved as we can on the mail in this. We're always on IRC. Uh, and this is something we want to keep continuing. Um, we did learn a lot of lessons from the Git Forge ODF. Um, we want to try and do these things in the right way. There were mistakes made. Um, we put our hands up and we're happy to say we made those mistakes and we want to try and address them. 
and two points out of that from from my perspective is way more higher touch points on the comms are needed here and we did have a very tight communication cycle with some of the internal stakeholders particularly the appointed council reps but we definitely needed more direct feedback with the community fesco and others during that process and that's something we'll definitely address going forward when we run the next odf because i think it's a really good framework and it's something that brings a lot of benefits to, to communicating in that style um, we just sent a mail to the devil thread uh, in the last two or three days about a survey that we want people to, to take on. Uh, let me just paste the link in here. I'll get it in a second if, if Pierre or Ifu could maybe grab it uh, and paste it in. And we want you to complete the survey. And there's 59 people on the call. If we even got half of those people responding, and it'll only take you 30 seconds to go through it uh, and give us their feedback because that shapes our communication cycle and that gives us that... Um, that ability to to evolve and become a better team and we do want to involve you more in our comms and our planning that is exactly why we had Eve on the call otherwise it would be just Pierre and myself talking about projects and challenges and so on and um, but you see how public we're making our workflow you see the opportunities for community members to effectively um, put a proposal together that can get backed by the rest of the community and taken on by CP and deliver something of value that means something to you and the community. So let us know what is working, let us know what we can improve and let us know what you want our team to focus on in the coming quarters. And we will do our level best to engage with you uh, and give you the time that you deserve to have that opinion heard. And if we can help, we can help. And if we can't, we'll certainly help you evolve that conversation um, and try to get that proposal into a better shape that we can bring it forward. And that I think is it from our side. So we're gonna hit the open Q&A section. Um, our email addresses are there, absolutely reach out, connect with us on social media. We're around the, the virtual conference for the next two days as well. Uh, and I do wanna take the time uh, again to thank everyone for turning up to this and for the support you've had for the CPE team um, and working with us through some very challenging issues in the last couple of months. And we're here doing our best and we hope we're being good servants to both the Fedora project and you in the community. So on behalf of the team, thank you very much. And we'll start taking the questions momentarily from Ben. See, so you've uh, very cleverly used up all of the, the time slot with the presentation. Oh. We'll throw a couple of questions in here real quick. Um, First was from Nick. Is there still a GDPR concern if things are moved to CommuniShift or Fedora's AWS account and thus are still hosted by Red Hat, but are primarily yeah. maintained by community members? Yes. Yeah, so GDPR um, views a data controller as someone, a data processor and a data controller. I, I can't remember which one is which, but effectively, if we host it, we fall into one of those categories and we are on the hook and we would have to work with the application maintainer to set up proposals and mechanisms. But ultimately, if that application maintainer steps away, that falls on us as a team. And it's something that is rather complex and legal. Um, and you would be frightened to know what GDPR um, considers to be private information. The badge that we're assumingly getting for turning up the nest is classified as a GDPR footprint because it self identifies something about me at a specific period in time. So things like that make this hugely complex just to lift and shift an application to commu shift and wash our hands of it from the CPE team. Right. Uh, so the next question, um, is there an update on GitLab or the timeline or scope of that? So the update is there is an open ticket with a number of technical challenges that are related to the FESCO points that were well made and well received by the team. Um, and we're working through that with GitLab. And there is an open um, AMA with the GitLab team early September. Aoife will possibly drop the date into the chat here. Uh, it's an open conversation, an ongoing conversation. And I'm hoping towards the autumn slash winter time that we start getting some timelines and clarity around that. Uh, um, the session with GitLab, I can actually speak a little bit more to it now. Um, so both myself and Clement Verna have been speaking and liaising with Maritza Sanchez, who's the senior community uh, manager from GitLab. An Ask Me Anything panel session on Thursday, the 10th of September through my office hour slot. We're gonna change it to a half an hour difference. So instead of, when do I start, um, 1300 UTC, it's gonna be 1330 UTC for an hour. Uh, about two weeks in ahead of the session, we're going uh, we're gonna have 
a document or a survey nurse is looking after that side of things that people can fill out i'll send out on behalf of our team and people can submit their um, most asked questions they are hoping that it's going to be a very engaging hour but they are going to have some answers prepped based on what the community feel are most important to that too so that should have been a date for your diary too but mark it down now thursday 10th of september ask me anything with gitlab all right. Um, so Nick said, I thought OSPO was going to take over some of the apps that CPE is dropping. Question mark. Could you repeat that again, Ben? Sorry, I got a glitch. Yep. Nick said, I thought OSPO was going to take over some of the apps that CPE is dropping. Correct. So OSPO is stepping in and taking over, I think it's between eight and 10 applications. Um, and we're working in a transition period with them. That obviously doesn't solve any GDPR problems because it's still part of the, the Red Hat ecosystem. Um, but they're going to take on some of that ownership. And I think the first couple of apps might have been transferred already. Um, and just a, a point on the GDPR, and I know I typed it in the chat, um, we are heavily engaged in legal on it. And I know Marie is involved in those conversations and Rich Bowen as well. Um, for both the Centre West and Fedora side to see, can we get a path forward from a community's perspective? OSPO is a great um, bridge for this, but I know we got some fantastically passionate people in the community that are well capable of minding these applications um, once we can untangle the, the GDPR aspects. So setting aside the data center move, how has the change of the team's scope and processes in the last year affected team morale and burnout and productivity? So as the manager, I don't think I can answer this because it's like blink if you're under duress, guys. I'll pass this to Pierre as the kind of tech lead. I think you're probably best place to take that, Pierre. You're muted. You're muted, Pierre. We ought to have a t-shirt that says that. Um, I think you're muted. The, um, I think this is a journey. I think this is a journey that we have not completed yet. Uh, and as every journey and kind of changes, it gets uh, it gets worse uh, before it gets better. Uh, the end result is to have the, to give the possibility of to everyone in the team to step out, you know, on the weekend to take time off, uh, actual time off, not you know. Uh, I'm officially picking my PTO because my manager told me that I have to spend my PTO, but I'm actually working just as a volunteer on you know as much time as I normally do on the being paid. Uh, so we actually want to have the freedom and we want people in the team to not feel guilty or feel like they can't move away because they are needed. Uh, so we want to increase the, the collaboration. We want to inc to spread the knowledge uh, so that you know you you the expert do not become the the point of failure uh, because you're the only expert so we want to build more experts in the team rather than having uh, people specialized there um, so that is this is the end goal i think this is the path we want to go and i think everyone would like being able to you know step away from the keyboard lock the lock the screen you should always lock the screen um, and just go go to a barbecue and you know if the phone rings because the server is done well you know it's going to be handled by someone else and you trust uh, that they will have uh, the, the, the knowledge that doesn't mean that we won't you know have to call people in when something dooms happens and uh, and we actually need someone who has more expertise to that but we don't want the expert to be called in at every single hours of the day and night for first level or second level uh, issues basically uh, so that's that's the angle but this is this is a chance it's a chance on how we have done things it's a chance to how people and especially the people who have been in the team for a long time have are used to work we used to have a lot of independence we used to have a lot of independence on how we organize our work on selecting what we work on and suddenly we need to take other into account we need to we work as a team which is great i mean loving to work as a team having people to bounce ideas being able to see what progress because you know that as soon as you have a progress open someone will go and review it and you know you will review someone else and work will flow uh, so it's much smoother and it goes it does give a good experience to work in in a team in the, in this dynamic um, but it is it is a transformation it is a change it is something that we need to add to um, accept it is also something that we need to adjust uh, everything that Lee wants to see is not necessarily something which would be applicable to the team. Uh, so there, it's going to be an ongoing communication between uh, where, how we 
we have we have an end goal. Uh, the discussion is going to be how we get there, and it won't be the direct path that some people would like us to do. It will be something uh, that goes around uh, and around, and you know, there is a pretty flowers over there that we want to go and check before we reach that end point there. Um, so yeah, there is. Uh, I think more all it's going to depend on a lot of things. The color move has been a drain on the energy and on a lot of people. Uh, some of these large projects, they basically rely on two people. You can't have a project this size rely on only two people without burning them down. So yeah, when I say, when I say send them cookies, you know, send them cookies. <laughs> Kevin and Smush definitely deserve all the cookies you can get them. Uh, they have been leading that project, so it, they are, yeah, they are, they are, there is fatigue, there is burned on, there is a, uh, there is aspect there. Uh, but the hope is that you know we have two more sysadmins in the team, David and Mark, and they should be able to be there and end all the day-to-day -day work and then let Kevin and Smooch uh, be able to do the, the more uh, in-depth work when needed and then Mark and David will onboard and learn on how to, get to do the, the more in-depth work as well. I hope I didn't say anything too crazy there. I'm looking at Ifa and, and Lee. Uh, they seem to be smiling, so I guess I'm, I, I didn't think you spoke too much. <laughs> and I will add for people who are Red Hat employees, you could also send Smooge and Kevin reward zone points. I'm sure they would also appreciate that. Um, so next question is, is there a timeline for retiring Fed message and will there be help for people who have Fed message consumers to convert to Fedora messaging? I can take that one. Uh, the timeline, yes, uh, as soon as possible. It's not going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> uh, the two, the two major roadblock which I see uh, for returning Fed message are going to be FMN and Data Gripper Data Number. Uh, they both have the same requirement. We need to have Fedora messaging schemas on every single application that published to the bus. Uh, this is an ongoing effort. Uh, Data Gripper needs. There, there is two approach we can take to Data Gripper. Is either we upgrade the current stack. Uh, but that means that we are maintaining something that we have built uh, for ourselves or we try to replace it by something off the shelf that can provide the same uh, functionalities uh, and potentially doesn't have doesn't put us on the hook to maintain it um, so data gripper is as a, as a pretty big uh, pre uh, requirement uh, the fed message uh, schemas to be done before it can get moved on but it potentially is something which is uh, which would be fine to to do and uh, easy to easy uh to do the fmn on the other hand is going to be a fairly large project it's going it needs to have uh, the ui resync it needs to be resync from a technology perspective from a ui perspective from a ux perspective uh it's pretty uh demanding from um, on technology side, being able to do notification on IRC, being able to do uh, email notifications uh, at the level of the entire project, as well as being able to let people manage which notification they want to to have. So it's pretty complex stack. Uh, so that one will uh, will require some work. And the bold estimate that we have for that is at least six to nine months for FMN. So that gives us, uh, you know, if we start working on this in next quarter, that gives us a uh, Fed message retirement by potentially the end of 2021, but uh, I wouldn't put my hand on. I wouldn't put my hand. Uh, I wouldn't bet my hand on that, basically. But that's. I think that's the timeline we can uh, hope for. As to and whether there is whether there will be help to migrate uh, Fed message consumers, uh, it's pretty straightforward to do. Uh, I'm happy to help anyone who was uh, who is in that situation. Uh, there is the the Fedora messaging documentation on read the docs is actually fairly complete. Uh, so it's easy. Uh... <laughs> Kevin Fenzi is just specifying a, just a small data point to give an idea about that I know data gripper. The database behind has a, almost 600 gigabytes of uh, in one table. So, you know, just a little bit of data to, to process. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, federal messaging has a lot of documentation on how to port, including from Fed message, and I'm happy to help anyone who is in that situation. And the sooner you can get started, you know, the better it is for you. And the last question on the list is from Paul, who wants to know if there's an Irish equivalent for the phrase soup to nuts. What the hell that means? Um, 
So I think I said the full whack and then Paul outdid me with uh, the whole kit and caboodle is definitely one. <laughs>